After the nap and a snack, Tony, Willow, Willie, and Puppy were out back finding out what Ben and Stephen had found. There was a big hill between the house and back part of the property. Tony turned and said, Look, what is that? What do you see? Willa asked. It looks like a great big snake under the dirt, Tony said loud enough for Ben and Stephen to hear. They both yelled, Snake! They grabbed Willie with the puppy chasing behind and went to get John. A few minutes later, What are you seeing, Tony? John had told the kids to stay in the house and he had come out to investigate. There is a large pipe or round thing that comes up over there and goes across and then goes back down into the ground. It's in that hill covered with dirt, Tony shared. He's been finding things like coins just below the ground level ever since the river thingy on Monday, Willa said. Something's about to happen. Come closer, John directed. There was a little shaker, not very high on the Richter scale. John had grown up around Mount St. Helens and experienced many little earthquakes as a young man. The last days in Seattle, the ground was shaking almost constantly. He reached out and hugged both kids to himself. Suddenly, the slope let loose and John saw about 20 feet of dirt coming at them. He formed a shield around them and waited. John's shield, if it could be seen, would look like a big stand-up hot water tank and it was around them. The dirt flowed around them and over them. John pushed up with all his might. Push up! John directed again. The kids helped. They ended up knee-deep in the dirt. John released his shield. As they looked around, they saw everyone coming out of the house. They were broiling two sockeyes on the outside grill. They were expecting about 30 people over for dinner. Billy had gone back after he had picked up Tony and Willa to allow Big Henry the afternoon off. He was going to show up at 3.30 p.m. just in time for the salmon to be done for an early dinner. The women were working on two big pots of fish chowder made from smoked salmon, king salmon in one and silver in the other. The dinner was going to be a tasting decision as to what went into the chowder to be canned. John was caught looking at Tony's snake. He'd seen a medal like that before. Every Wednesday, three or four pounds showed up at the bank. From what he could make of it, it appeared to be 80 feet long. Most of it was still covered, so it could go on beyond that. What was visible was at the very top of the arch had to be almost eight feet in diameter, formed in a very oddly shaped circle. John went into a trance, seeing himself sitting in his Christ port. Is this enough gold to get the world working again? No. Part of the world working? Yes. Willa was going to talk with John and Tony stopped her. He's asking if there is enough gold there to get the world working again. Gold? Willa looked at Tony. Yeah, gold, and now I realize I can see it, even if it is buried five or six feet deep. There is another mountain on the way to school. I think it has silver in it. This is not going to be a normal life, is it? Willa looked into Tony's eyes. You wanted me to be sure? Willa asked. My mom and dad talked many times about birth control that did not work, the seven kids. I would die for you, but better, I want a life with you. Tony almost fell from the impact of his chosen mate as she wrapped him up in a big hug. Jenny was watching John and the kids. He was up touching the metal or yellow rock or whatever it was. John looked down at her and nodded, then smiled. Henry Frank came up to Jenny. What's he looking at? Part of the solution. Jenny smiled. Chief John also joined them. Part of the solution to what? Tony was helping Willa down. When she was safe, he answered the question, putting part of the world back to work. How? Samuel asked. Tony asked his intuition and got with 2,000 tons of gold. Tony pointed to the pretty yellow rock that his papa was touching. He repeated what he had just heard. The call went out for another dozen or more people to come to see. The four shovels from the tool shed were in use to dig out the pretty metal. The fish were joined by another that was in the fridge. More big pans of fish chowder were added to the stove. Maiden Nation took over the kitchen. Once upon a time, she had been the assistant manager of the cannery and for many years ran the place. Her knowledge worked well in feeding 40 or 50. Jenny and Margaret were there learning everything they possibly could from her. As people settled in, they had adopted many of the Seattle area children into their homes because they lost their parents. Kids were everywhere having a blast. They had picked up the excitement from the adults. Herb had his gold testing unit up against the metal. He had taken dozens of readings, and Patty was recording the information. 
Herb would draw a two-sue circle with a Sharpie and gave it a date and a number. Patty, with Sally's help, was recording numbers and readings under the date. All the readings were all between 90% and 95%. The two girls had a good feel for what Herb was measuring. With Ben and Steven's help, Herb would put tape around the massive arch about every four feet. The calculated estimate would later show at least a ton per inch. What they didn't see was another mass of gold buried under the West End. After the find had been melted down and refined, Tony's 2,000 metric tons would prove to be closer to fact than all the calculations made. John realized his niece's family was digging out the gold and making a nice working level with the dirt. He wondered why they were so excited. The answer placed a smile on his face. His niece's family knew what they were doing. John would find out later they'd been making gold and silver jewelry for over 30 years. John would soon learn that it would be his niece and her family who would keep all the coin machines supplied. He predicted half a million in the next 12 months and over 4 million in the year following. John played with the numbers and realized he was creating another industry. Tony told him of the mountain with a big house-sized structure in it that he believed was silver. This was not the last of the finds of precious metals. John thought of the need for a bigger vault. During this thought process, he looked around for Perry and Molly. They were standing about 50 feet away, and Perry started moving towards John when he caught Perry's eye. We need a much bigger vault. Perry answered John's look like Fort Knox. Tony did some research. He was beginning to realize how big a job he was going to take on for the world. He sat at the men's table. He shared his findings. Gentlemen, we have enough gold and silver to support an economy of the Western states. If we compare our two pound 24 tons of gold and 50 tons of silver to the nations of the world before the earth changes, we rank sixth. Dad, I suggest Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Tony, did you say sixth? Johnny asked. Yeah, Tony shared, nodding his head. Dad, I think Tony has the right of it. We need to consolidate the U.S. in the next five to ten years. Johnny shared, the western states would be a good start. What does everyone think? John asked. We have not had anybody come in and ask for help concerning food or work in the last week. I have seen six help wanted signs during the last day. The Riverside community is also working at full capacity wanting more employees. I can name off a dozen communities that are seeing lots of work because of Uomak. People come into town, we find them an employer, then a place to live temporarily if possible. John Nation shared, what's the next step? Well, God, are we ready? Thank you for all that we have received. Guide us in all that we do, John prayed. I see people on horses coming from all directions. What is their destination? Johnny asked. Omak, John Taylor answered. They are coming here. Wasn't it Kevin Costner that said, build it, they will come? Yes, the field of dreams, Billy shared. Everyone started talking about the movie. Willa continued serving her man and just expanded those duties to the table he sat at. Jenny and Patty moved about the party, making sure everyone had enough to eat, drink, and had a good time. Monday morning, Tony, Willa, John, and Margaret Nation went with John to view the property where Tony believed there was a large metal deposit. It's your property, John. Margaret was looking at John's property list. What's the address, Margaret? John asked. 247 Cherry Ave West, Margaret shared. What are you thinking? John Nation asked. I think we need to put up another help wanted sign. John Taylor laughed. Excuse me for a minute. He then made a call to his niece. It's ours. Tony is seeing something as big as my house. His feelings are telling him it's silver. Okay, we will see you in a bit. John hung up and Willow was looking at Tony. What's he sensing? He says hundreds of thousands of years ago, a big asteroid hit the earth and broke up into a dozen or more pieces and they're all close. Willa said, he says this one is 10 times the mass of the gold in the backyard, 20,000 tons of silver. John Taylor whistled in approval. Is this enough to get the North American continent going? Margaret asked while looking at her husband. I get a yes on that along with South America. We are going to be busy. John Taylor shared. John did not know how prophetic he was in his comment about being busy. At noon on Monday, Tony and Willow went back to fishing. That afternoon, a train came into town. 
John knew of the railroad track. He assumed that it was a normal thing. A little later, he saw three men coming towards him. Chester and Cecil, he knew. The third man he had not met yet. When they entered the bank, John looked over at April and she nodded and moved in the direction of the fridge and cold water. John, good to see you again. Cecil Angstrom announced, you know Chester and I would like you to meet Percy Hansen. John shook hands all around and motioned them to the table as April brought four bottles of water. Do you all know anything about the train in town? John looked at the three men. Yeah, Cecil and I have everything we own on it. Percy shared, my longtime neighbor, partner, and a good friend got shot and killed last week. My crew and I have been in three firefights since the earth changes. We used up the last of our ammunition on the train ride to get here. Percy took a drink of water. My wife and kids were scared to death to even go outside. I almost had to force them to get on the train. So you have, John started to ask, a train load full of cars. Percy smiled, and a whole lot of equipment to make more cars. I also picked up a tanker full of high-octane gasoline. Percy saw the blank look on a few faces. That's almost 32,000 gallons. Show him the vault, John. He doesn't believe me. Cecil smiled. Come with me. John got up and escorted the three men to the vault. When you run out of smart cars, are you willing to call them Omax? If my wife and kids are safe, then Omax sounds like a good name. Percy laughed with the other three men. He then entered the back room of the big vault. He looked Cecil in the eye and nodded. How much? We have here 20 tons of gold and 50 tons of silver. We just discovered a vein of 2,000 tons of gold and a big rock with 20,000 tons of silver. John shared. As they made their way back to the table, Omak is just a first step, Cecil asked. Yes, somewhere down the road, our cars may be sold worldwide. John shared as he sat down. I believe there is an area just south of the railroad that may have a couple hundred acres of little used land available. John looked up as he saw two smiling faces coming into the bank. John, Margaret, please join us. John stood when the chief and his wife came close. Gentlemen, this is the chief of the people and mayor of Omak and his wife. John and Margaret Nation. Friends, you know, Chester, Cecil, and this is Percy Hansen. We were just talking about needing hundreds of acres to build an automotive plant, to build little cars, little trucks, and an economical van. We also have some good news, Margaret gushed. She looked to her husband. I gave a man three gold coins for a little black horse this morning. John Nation shared. Yes. Chester knew of the history of a black horse. John Taylor just sat and enjoyed the moment. It was almost like the announcement of a birth. Gentlemen, as a small boy, our friend had a black horse come into his life that years later died saving John's life. We've heard it has returned to be with John and his family once again. I found him this morning. I'm almost expecting him to follow us into the bank. The chief looked back at the door. First thing the little fellow did was check out all of John's pockets. Margaret laughed. That's what Blackie would do. I always had a carrot or sugar cube or something in my pocket for him. John Nation shared, you said something about needing hundreds of acres to build an automotive plant. Yeah, only this time we do it right and make the workers part owners. John Taylor stunned the table. If you end up with 1,000 employees and they each pay $250 a year for 10 years, that would be $20,500,000. Pre-earth changes, that would be $25 million. There's your working capital base to be able to ultimately take the first step in expanding this to cover the earth. Percy had gone to school with Chester and Cecil. They looked at each other and smiled. The smiles turned to laughter and the three were having trouble composing themselves. The biggest problem with the American automotive industry was the unions. The three of us used to sit around having a beer and talk about profit sharing and employee ownership. You have the right of it, Mr. Taylor. Percy answered, you're going to have to build it yourself. All of our people are learning how to build houses and put in sidewalks. John shared. Percy looked to Cecil, who was nodding. We can do that. Between me and Cecil, we have 40 men and their families with me. I hear you have a standard wage of $20 per day. That's correct. Although right now with the good weather, we are paying eight silver coins for a 60 hour work week. Not bad for a week. John smiled. 
We have free health care for everyone at the pharmacy across the street. As people become trained, we are seeing many of the older folks have their immortality gene turned on who are happy to become useful and work again either on a full or part-time basis. Percy thought for a second, that'll work. I have about 100 pounds in gold and about 500 pounds of silver to deposit into your bank. John nodded and smiled. 3% interest? That seems like a fortune compared to what we used to get. Percy laughed. I inherited over 5 million several years ago. I tried to put it all into gold and silver. Everyone disagreed with me. At least I got what I did. Everything else is gone. Percy shared. Percy, what you have will be worth about $700. Add a zero and that would make it 7 million pre-earth changes, John calculated. Thank you, John. It feels like I did well then. I'm just concerned about it being enough to build my plant. Percy smiled. You have the backing of this bank, Percy. John informed, bring a thousand jobs to this part of the world. We are building housing now, and the area the new housing is going into has another 600 acres that will hold another 1,000 homes very well. Oh, more good news. We are having a drawing, and we are pulling 21 names out of the hat. The first name gets to move into our first finished house on October 1st. Then every day for a week, another family gets to move in, then two families every day for the second week. We hope by the middle of October, we have four families moving in every day. We are hoping that by November 1st, we will have eight families moving in every day, with that number going to 16 families before Thanksgiving, Margaret reported. How big are the houses? Percy asked. With the basement finished, 1,120 square feet, Margaret shared. How much? Percy asked. We think we can sell them for $19,050 with a 3% 15-year or 3.5% 20-year mortgage. Zero down. Let the buyers put in the grass and give them a one-month mortgage payment coupon upon painting the outside of their home. Every home has a half acre, which is enough for a good garden. Margaret smiled. A half acre of apple trees will pay for the mortgage in five years. I want to move here. Percy let out a whistle and looked to Cecil. I need an architect. John grabbed his cell phone. As he looked at the bars on his phone, he thought, oh good, it's working today. He looked up Perry's number and hit dial. Hi Perry, we need an architect. I'm at the bank. We are going to build a manufacturing plant for cars, trucks, and vans. See you in a bit. After he hung up, John investigated his phone address directory again. He found the number he was looking for and hit dial again. Roger, this is John Taylor. You guys got any fish yet? Well, don't take them all. We need a bunch to spawn. John laughed and shared with the table. Roger says there's enough fish to walk across the river without getting his feet wet. Roger, what I called you about, we're going to need you to put on the third shift. Do that, I'll buy you lunch. See you in a bit. John folded his phone. He's coming here for lunch. The next day, Perry, Percy, Brad Summers, and a dozen others were busy surveying the land. John, there are 3,000 acres down here, so where are you, Her, Perry announced over the phone. Good, save some room for us to build a capital for the state of, no, for the Western states or something bigger. Anyway, we don't need access to the railroad. We'll do, John. I got Brad Summers down here too. We'll get the plant started and then measure it all. Perry shared with Percy and Cecil as he spoke with John on the phone. We will let you take a look at the final layout. Good. Brad needs room for his hotel too. John shared. We'll work that in John. Talk later. Perry hung up the phone. He wants some room to build a capital building. He thinks it's for the Western States or something. The men all laughed. I think it will be for the world. We better give him a thousand acres for the capital and supporting buildings, Jimmy James shared. We need a hundred acres for the hotel, restaurants, and other supporting shops and stores. Brad Summers shared, I feel the same way. We will spend some time on this as soon as we get the plant going. Perry shared, I swear to God, I can see it. We're going to have our names on some interesting buildings before we're done. You were right about working with different crews one day a week. I'm beginning to understand the how in the building. It certainly helps with the where and why when I draw it, Jimmy shared. I've had to use the original drawings of my father's hotel during the last five years on hundreds of occasions. 
I've been amazed at the changes and other things that don't line up in the actual building versus the drawings. Brad Summers shared, when I worked with the carpenters, it made it feel real, not just lines on a piece of paper. Perry smiled. A good carpenter knows what can be changed from the drawings to make it work. Going fishing Sunday? Jimmy asked. No, I'm stuck working at the hotel. Brad shared, I'll be down there next week. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Perry laughed. Molly's working at the cannery. She brought home some smoked sockeye chowder. Man, was that ever good. She was going on and on about her day, and I asked her to marry me. She stopped talking and looked at me. Then she said, absolutely, congratulations, from both Brad and Jimmy. The Taylor home. At breakfast, John kept seeing the vision of men on horseback all coming to Omak once again. He mentioned it to Jenny and she laughed. She got up and found the notice of several things that had not been attended to yet. She opened it up and started reading. We originally planned on the meeting of the elected county and officers of the regional districts to be held in Spokane. Spokane is too dangerous to enter currently. We understand the county of Okanogan is working at full capacity. We want to meet there and find out how to make our communities vibrant and productive again. We also ask everyone to consider choosing a leader that will continue to support our nation's constitution and can protect our borders. We also desire that this person be able to bring prosperity to the Western states in British Columbia. This notice has been addressed to British Columbia, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. John, there's gonna be hundreds of people here. I mean, Jenny shared. We also need to contact Harry Jones in Hawaii. John shared. The bunch from Oregon showed up yesterday. They went to the grocery and tried to buy food with greenbacks. The grocery store sent them to our bank. When April offered a $20 silver coin for $200 of greenbacks, she believed the man wanted to draw his gun and shoot her. She looked him in the eye and pushed a notepad and pencil in his direction. She asked him who she was supposed to notify when he died. He said he wasn't going to die anytime soon. She started laughing at him. Then April told him to grab her neck, and he did. But he may have broken his thumb when he tried, John reported. I didn't know April had a green lanyard. John was excited his niece had been taking classes. Me too, Dad, Ben smiled. Only Peter won't let anybody shoot at me yet. He says I have to get older. John looked at Jenny. Peter, Dan, Master Son, Mia and all of them have classes going all over the country. A lot of the Seattle police officers are helping. Jenny shared, they do construction during the day and run classes at night. A knock sounded on the back door. Sally jumped up and welcomed in John's niece, Kathy and nephew, Tori. When they came to the table, Tori carefully set a big chunk of gold on a placemat at the end of the table. It's over 100 pounds. We figured out how to cut it with Herb's help at the hardware store. We can harvest a ton or more every day. The cutters will also cut the silver, Kathy reported. You may have found a way to save the world. John smiled. We are going to need the biggest furnace and pots available. Ideally two, one for gold and one for silver. Tori shared. We've ordered 12 furnaces and six dozen pots from Spokane. Now if we can just get them out of there. John shared. We are hoping they show up today or tomorrow. Meeting family. Bill and his partner went and had lunch at Sue's famous cafe. There were hundreds of seats and a lot of them were filled. A young lady took them to a table and handed them the lunch menu. I'll be right back. Do we have enough left from the $20? Bill's partner asked. I've got $3 of my own in change and $8 in coins to buy food tomorrow. Bill announced, let's get a bowl of fish chowder, a sandwich and a cup of coffee. If we can catch a few fish, we'll be fine. A little while later, Bill and his partner were stuffed. That was good, Bill's partner shared as he loosened his belt. I haven't been this full in a while. Anything else I can get you, gentlemen? The young lady asked. Just the bill, ma'am. Sorry, but your bill has been paid and I even got a nice tip. The young girl shared. May I ask who paid for our lunch? Bill asked. White Eagle did. You'll find him over there at the big table near the window. The two men stood and moved towards the big table. Bill recognized the young lady who'd fixed his thumb. 
I wonder what a nice tip is, Bill's partner asked. I don't know, but I'd like to find out. I've got $11 in my pocket, and it feels better than 100 used to. Bill responded. Do you suppose a quarter? Bill's partner asked. Bill looked at him. Maybe. I sure like this real money a whole lot better than that funny money. I like what it buys, Bill's partner patted his stomach. Sir, are you the one they call White Eagle? Bill put his hand out, and when John grabbed it to shake, there was an electric shock that went through the two of them. Sir, this is my distant cousin, James Ledgerwood. I'm William Taylor, by the way. John looked to his son and motioned for him to join them. Johnny, here are two more cousins. Gentlemen, I am proud to introduce John Taylor Jr. He is the great, great, great grandson of William Taylor and William Ledgerwood. He is also the great, great grandson of James Taylor and Rachel Ledgerwood. Jenny was giggling and shared, that young lady at the bank, the one named April, is John's niece. Bill closed his eyes and shook his head. Ooh, have a seat. John laughed. We gotta be getting back. We have 38 hungry guys back at camp. If we don't return soon, they'll eat us before we can tell them about the food we bought, James Ledgerwood informed. What's your plan? Where's your camp, John asked. Just off Highway 97, south of the river, Bill Taylor shared. We need to get the food back and return to do some fishing if we can. Tell your guys the hotel will be ready for them tomorrow. John smiled. Come into town and find the People's Trust tent. Be there by 7 o'clock a.m. I'll buy all of you breakfast. What does something like that cost? James Ledgerwood asked. A dollar twenty in coins, John shared. Wow, this is like heaven, Bill Taylor stated. We'll be there. Tomorrow, we'll be having a fresh salmon bake behind the hotel at noon. I'll be with you guys for the next few days, John shared. Are there others coming? James asked. Clark. We think we're going to have almost 500, John shared. See you guys tomorrow? Yeah, we'll do that, both men agreed. When John re-entered the bank, he found another group of men. It only took a few words spoken to confirm they were from British Columbia. John took them across the street and bought them lunch. Upon speaking with them, he discovered almost half of them were from Alaska. While John was with them, he called up the chief. John, we're going to have a lot of visitors over the next few days. They'll have a couple of hundred horses. As John said this, he realized he was going to be off by a bunch. That's going to be a problem. Let me talk to some people. The chief responded. Chief, now that I'm talking aloud, I'm hearing closer to 500 or 600 horses. John shared, that's going to be a really big problem. I'll get back to you. John could tell the chief was frowning. At the fishing hole, I'm glad you are here. We just got the net repaired and in the water. We only have about 400 fish with three nettings. Big Henry was talking to Tony and Willa as they walked in ready to go back to work. By three o'clock, everything was winding down. The net was being put away and the poles were coming out. Bill Taylor and James Ledgerwood and nine others had helped carry fish to the tables. As the men joined in, most of the kids moved over to help carry fish from the tables to the racks. Rods in hand, Bill and James had barely sat down when they both had fish on. Brad worked with James and Tony worked with cousin Bill. The two men brought their fish in and had their pictures taken. Today had been the first time since the earth changes that the two men remembered smiling. The 11 men from Oregon were promised to have all the smoked fish they could carry when they went back home. They all sat and visited with the kids as they ate another bowl of smoked fish chowder. The ladies filled two buckets with lids for the men to take back to their camp. The fish chowder was a welcomed addition to a diet lacking in volume since the earth changes. The next morning, the buckets were dropped off empty and cleaned as the Oregon group moved to have breakfast with John Taylor at the People's Trust tent at 7 o'clock a.m. There, they met the group from British Columbia and Alaska. Another group from the east that included Montana, Idaho, and Utah was there too. The groups were seeing signs going up on all the major roads coming into town. Welcome county executives and distinguished friends. The incoming roads had seen lots of different transportation methods. It looked like a movie scene out of the early 1900s. John and Jenny took time out to visit Harry Jones at the Royal Hawaiian. When he heard there was a gathering of county execs in Omak, he pulled many of the original 50 who had met when John and Jenny were on their honeymoon. 
Jenny met with Eddie and Bill Wiggins. They said they would be there. When she came back, John and Harry, along with 26 others, transported back to Omak. The high school was not in session because of the fishing. Margaret and Jenny called for volunteers and got a few high school students, along with another hundred senior citizens, to explain how the system worked. People continued coming in from all over the Western states. The high school had a performing arts center that would seat a thousand. John moved into that, and between the morning and afternoon sessions, they got to know each other. John had his friend Officer McCormick put on a shooting demonstration. There was also a session on healing, and many of the group had different ailments that were attended to. John then took everyone to God. Four disappeared. John went over and touched God and was surprised at the conversations going on regarding the four men. The man from Spokane who had originally scheduled the conference was one of the four. Everyone realized the four men were not fitting in and had their plans to turn this into their empire. On the morning of the third day, John was planning on explaining the money system. Everyone had asked dozens of questions and had a pretty good grasp of how things went from the seniors and kids. The $6 hotel charge, the $1.20 breakfast of steak and eggs, the 50 or 60 cent lunches all made sense as the seniors and kids explained each point. Was this a meeting to establish a constitutional Congress? 